Hello, this is Professor Keith Ross from the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. This is going to be part two of my criminal investigation le lecture on criminal identification systems. I had omitted some slides and I want to make sure that I cover them. So this one's going to be really, really short. Um, I last left off discussing DNA exemplars. So I'm now on slide number 23, which is familial DNA. Now, if you remember, in lecture number one, I discussed the concept of mitochondrial DNA, and that mitochondrial DNA is specific to maternal bloodlines, and that Y-strain DNA samples are specific to paternal bloodlines, meaning that we will have the same exact ones. Well, when we're talking about familial DNA, we're not talking ab about exact DNA profiles, but very close, very, very similar. It is the process of identifying suspects by generating a list of people whose DNA closely resembles the genetic makeup entered into the CODA system. So we might not have the same exact nuclear DNA as our mothers and our fathers, but there are definitely going to be similarities between those exemplars because we are made up of maternal and paternal DNA. Familial DNA does not provide an exact match, but a family relationship. So if you have siblings, a brother or a sister, again, your DNA profiles are going to look very similar. There are going to be differences, obviously, because we are all each unique individuals. The list generally consists of parents, children, and sim siblings. So just like, my, unlike mitochondrial DNA, mitochondrial DNA is just the mother, when we're talking about familial DNA, we're obviously talking about family, usually bloodline connections. Touch DNA or trace DNA is aptly named uh, for how DNA is left at the crime scene. The perpetrator touches something. Now, touch DNA, trace DNA can be very, very small samples of DNA. And more often than not, we will compare them to either nuclear or mitochondrial DNA. Investigators must search the right area where DNA is most likely to be found and avoid swabbing everything. We didn't really talk about Edmund Locard and the exchange principle, but on, what he talks about is the fact that as investigators, we have to look at the total picture. So if you're processing a crime scene, and we've talked about crime scenes already, make them as big as possible because you can always shrink a crime scene. So this is basically that same sort of idea. The role of DNA investigations. DNA has many uses in criminal investigations, but mostly it helps police cast, uh, catch perpetrators, suspects of the crime. Place a suspect at the scene or a weapon in his or her hand exonerates the innocent, as we've talked about, can refute a claim of self-defense possibly, prove or disprove an alibi, because if someone says they weren't at a place at the time and we can pull a DNA sample, well, that shows that they were at least there. Might not show the time you're going to need other evidence to connect times to it, but it proves that that person was there. Seals a conviction. Uh, the last two concepts that we're going to talk about are forensic crime labs. So we've talked about criminal identification systems, but in order to have this system, you have to be able to process it. So when we're talking about CODIS databases through computers, the APHIS system comparing fingerprints, well, we're going to do that in a laboratory. So there are approximately 400 labs in the United States with over 4 million requests per year. Uh, this this uh, textbook was published in 2017. I'm going to assume that 4 million is now a higher number. Not exactly sure what. The first crime lab was established in Los Angeles, California by August Vollmer. Don't really have to know Vollmer's name. In 1932, the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, established its own crime lab in its headquarters in Quantico, Virginia. How forensic labs are operated, there is an operations section that contains the following units of expertise. Some of these we've already talked about. The latent print unit. So what does the latent print unit do? Well, they analyze fingerprints. And basically, 
what we're talking about, more often it, they can analyze patent or visible print, but more often than not, they are latent or invisible prints that we have made visible via ninhydrin powder, and now we're going to process and compare. Biological units, biological units, things like ser serology, blood, semen, saliva, stuff like that. Trace evidence. Trace evidence is, again, that Edmo Edmund Locard exchange principle that any sort of small evidence, you know, if we shake hands, what happens? Well, I have DNA on this hand. The DNA that was on this hand now goes on this hand and vice versa. So very small, sometimes imperceptible to the naked eye. Uh, impression evidence, uh, ballistics, ballistics, what are we talking about? We're talking about firearms. Uh, one of the things about firearms is what kind of cartridge was expelled from that firearm. Was it a full metal jacket or a hollow point cartridge? Full metal jackets spin faster and they have more stopping power than hollow points. Uh, also, tracking the velocity of how a cartridge is expended from a firearm. Question documents, that, that could be anything. Uh, it could be counterfeit artwork, stuff like that toxicology and drug testing, sort of one, not really one in the same, but sort of related toxicology. If someone was poisoned with arsenic, Windex, whatever the case, well, you have to test for that. And obviously drug testing as well. And we're not talking about drug testing people, but if I affect an arrest on the street because I observe someone with, let's say, crack cocaine, I can only testify that in my training and experience, it appears to be crack cocaine. But I can't 100% say on the stand that I knew it was crack cocaine without performing some sort of chemical test. And that chemical test would be performed in a forensics lab. The admissibility of DNA evidence. It appears as if DNA typing is limitless. No one knows what we're going to be talking about in the future of DNA. But DNA has really only been around since 1988 as forensic evidence. So... There are two cases that I think we should note when applying legal standards to whether DNA evidence is going to be allowed in court via map hearings and things like that. So the admissibility of DNA evidence, I'm on slide number 29. Depending on what state you live in, two court cases affect the testimony of forensic scientists and criminalists. These are both people that would work in forensic laboratories. And what examinations were done and how they were done. So it's going to be Fry versus the United States and Daubert versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals. Really quickly, the Fry standard states that in order for a scientific technique to be admissible, it must be sufficiently established. It means that we have to show that it has worked before, that its results have been both credible and reliable, that the results are true, and we continue using this standard and getting true results, have gained general acceptance in its particular field to which it belongs. It is a tougher standard because some new methods of sort of tech DNA analyzation techniques have not been, quote unquote, accepted in the mainstream scientific community. And the Daubert ruling, the Supreme Court stated that a trial judge will make an independent assessment of expert reliabilities, meaning that if I am a prosecutor and or a defense attorney and I bring in an expert witness uh, with Daubert, the judge will have to assess whether this expert will be allowed to testify. So the Supreme Court stated that the trial judge will make an independent assessment of expert reliability, as well as the processes and procedures used in a pre-trial hearing. This ruling was to limit the amount of courtroom showdowns between pr the prosecutor's uh, expert witnesses and the defense attorney's expert witnesses. We, we, don't, we don't want, you know, uh, a gaggle of 20 experts on the prosecutor side and 100 on the defense. One or two will be sufficient. I just wanted to make sure that I clarified these concepts, so I apologize for missing them in part one. This is going to be uploaded as Criminal Identification Systems Part 2. I, again, wish you all a great day and have a good one. Bye.